What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. It is Monday, so you know we're going behind the scenes in the fantasy football industry, bringing on another influencer in the space to talk about the branding, the marketing, the social, all that type of stuff, um, because that's a big interest of mine, as well as uh, I want to inspire some of you guys who are maybe trying to make their way up in the industry, need some ideas, need some inspiration, motivation. We are joined with Paige Dimakos at the underscore sports page on Twitter, on Instagram. She is the host of TD Fantasy Football Podcast, as well as a longtime sports journalist and on-camera personality, a Twitter personality, Instagram personality, director of Fantasy Football at Sea. She's got a whole long resume. Um, so Paige, welcome to the channel. And uh, I'm super excited to have you on. I think you have a ton of interesting stuff going on in your um, career right now. So I'm excited to talk to you and, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You know, I, uh, as you follow me on social media, you know, I love talking about fantasy football, even though it's not fantasy football season. So it's actually nice to talk about, uh, some of the more generic things and maybe more about my career, because it's a good time. If you're, if you're thinking about getting into the fantasy space, now's a good time to start making those connections and, and network yourself. So that way you're prepared, uh, post draft season, post NFL draft season, to really get it going for fantasy. Yeah, for sure. I, I kind of look at fantasy football as a as a lifestyle at this point. It's kind of mm -hmm. it's all year round. But I wanted to, you know, because when I when I pick people to come on to the channel for these episodes, they're pretty specific, and I have a reason behind each person, and I try to get them to come on because they're all very different. And uh, as I, you know, I, I find someone I want, and then I kind of harass them on Twitter enough <laughs> until they eventually agree to come on, which is kind of what I did with you. Um, <laughs> And when I, once I finally get them to agree, then I start doing the research. And when I started looking at, you know, what you've done and things that you've accomplished, I was, I was super impressed because a lot of the people that have built an influence in the fantasy football industry have really done so within the last few years, because that's when fantasy football has really kind of taken a turn for, you know, being more popular and being more mainstream. But you are someone who's deeply rooted into like sports you know, journal, journalism and, and like actual sports for, for a long time, going back to when you were younger. So kind of, you know, take me through your path of um, how you got into like fantasy football. Like why is fantasy so interesting to you when you focused for so long on, on just sports in general? So uh, I started playing fantasy football. I'm 29 now when I was 16 years old. So Jeez. I like to call myself <laughs> a fantasy football hipster because I was playing way before it was really cool. Um, and I think the, the path for me as far as fantasy football goes is while I was in college, which is part of probably your research, um, I started a sports website called Corn Fed Sports, um, and I was covering Nebraska sports, specifically uh, every sport, but a lot of Nebraska football, obviously, because that's the, the big draw there. Um, and while I was in school, guys that you may have heard of, Nadama Kinsu, Kenny Bell, Prince of Mukamara, a lot of those guys were playing on the team at the Amir Abdullah um, a lot of these guys, Rex Burkhead, now I got to shout him out because he's a Super Bowl winner. Yeah. Uh, those guys were all in school with me at the at that time. And I always tried to find uh, a fun avenue to talk to athletes because I played sports. My brother played sports. My dad was a pro athlete. So I always <laughs> – I, I hated the X's and O's conversation because I've never heard a great interview with an athlete talking about – you know, it's third and one, what were you thinking at that? You know, that just, it, it, to me, it's not interesting. I don't care. Um, and, and I think that's why fantasy became such a interesting topic to me because it's a game within a game. And although there are some athletes that are apprehensive to it, the younger generation, our generation, millennials, and then Gen Z below us, I think really em kind of embraces fantasy football um, I interviewed Todd Gurley over the summer at Gatorade Awards, and I loved hearing him talk smack about how he deserved to be the number one overall pick. <laughs> okay. um, and I think for me, like his interview with me was so much more engaging because I wasn't talking to him about, you know, what are your expectations for the Rams this season? It was about him and who he is and who he is as an individual um, and, and how he thinks he's, you know, everybody thinks they're the best, right? And I loved hearing that from him and I loved hearing him talk smack and I loved the, the rebound story, you know, where people are hitting him up on Twitter, blasting him with yeah. Jeff Fisher's <laughs> coach about being a fantasy football bust. And now he's like, what of it? You know, like, what's, what's up now? Um, so I, I love that stuff. And that's, it's kind of like the long winded answer of it, but it started while I was in college. 
Um, and it started just as a positioning thing. Like one, I like playing two, I'm ultra competitive and I like kicking ass. And oh, yeah. three, I, I think it's a game within a game. So it's the least serious version of sports, which to me makes it more fun. Yeah. I mean, the, the popularity of it's growing to the point where it's almost as important from a fan's perspective as the game itself. And I do want to get an NFL player onto my channel for this series because I want to hear their uh, point of view when it comes to fantasy football. I'd imagine they kind of hate it at this point because, like, that's probably all they hear. Like, Todd Gurley, for instance, probably can't go anywhere without someone, you know, yelling at him and telling him how they lost the fantasy playoffs because of him or whatever. Uh, but, yeah, that, I mean, that's a great point because, you know, interacting with the players – you see the interviews and they're so boring. Like no one, they're going to give you like cookie cutter answers. And like, no one wants yeah. to hear that shit, you know, after a while. So giving them like a fresh perspective on something that's new um, is definitely, you know, it's, that's interesting because um, I haven't, I actually haven't heard that as like an inspiration of why someone has gotten into fantasy football so far. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's a, I think a good example of it is like the bears defense this year, uh, <laughs> probably, probably won a lot of people, their fantasy leagues. And I was just at Super Bowl, and I was with Prince because Prince and I obviously go back to our Nebraska days, are good friends. And I'm sitting there with Prince and Jordan Howard, and I was laughing because I was positioning them to kind of battle back and forth, just in a conversation about like, yo, the Bears defense, they won a lot of people fantasy football <laughs> this year, like more people than even like Jordan Howard, who is considered to be a top twelve running back, and a lot of. So I think it was funny to kind of watch them battle back and forth. I was like, hey. Like the defense matters, and like I love that Prince was like super prideful about like yo, like we matter. Like we <laughs> play in an individual defensive league. Like defense matters, tackles matter. I'm like, listen, you're preaching to the choir, man. I'm all in. So yeah. it was a it was a fun conversation, and I liked hearing it, taking it from that angle uh, with the guys. That's pretty cool. So you, you got the you got the real hookups in the industry, huh? <laughs> it's for me. I've always been a good a natural networker. Um, I just like I, I I people call it networking. I just consider it being myself Be, being a person um, yeah being a human yeah, just <laughs> yeah. being a human being um, yeah i grew up in a greek family so my family's super loud and to like to be able to talk as a kid you just kind of had to be loud too <laughs> so i just got used to being like i'm not intimidated to be in any room uh i'm super comfortable talking to anybody i'm always interested in the people angle um and i think that's what's you know a lot of these a lot of these guys i think that's why i always have a good personal connection with them is because i don't talk to them about stuff that i know is going to piss them off you know I'm, I'm like hey i think you're interesting as a person not hey i think you're really cool because you're an athlete yeah um, and they just want to be treated like everybody else uh and the second you start getting all googly eyed over them they're they're out they got enough people that are fangirling or fanboying over them. So that's that's why I think I've always had success in, in talking and developing relationships with athletes. Yeah, I kind of feel the same way. Like when I do some of these interviews and I have people like comment down below, they're like, oh, you're very like cool and calm and collected on the interviews when you're with these influencers. But like, if you just remind yourself, like you're just a person, you know, I'm just having a, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. It's not, you're not any better than me or worse than me. We're no. just like two humans. So I think that's- For sure. Yeah. I went to bed last just like you went to bed I woke up this morning and had breakfast and like everybody else like I think people forget that everybody's just like we're just humans we're all the same like they just happen to be really talented at sports like I'm I have a lot of strengths too and so do you like it the, theirs just happens to make them a lot of money that's the only, right that's the only reason why people freak out about it so, the only I mean, the only difference yeah. between me and Todd Gurley yes that's it. very very much so that is literally the only difference between the two I don't I don't see any others but you talk about um, you know, your social following, I want to segue into something you mentioned before, but I, I was, I was looking back at, you know, some of your first jobs that you held and one of them was at AZ sports mm -hmm. and, um, you know, you had built a social following prior to working there, I believe. Right. And then you got yes. discovered pretty much off of that. And this is a super interesting conversation that I like to think about. Because the way I see uh, the the workforce going right now, especially just in our country, is that when you build um, you know a personal brand and when you build a following, it just so happens to be on social media. I don't want people to take that in like a you know like a hippie kind of corny way. But when you build a following through social media, you give yourself an incredible amount of leverage and and power in these situations and. In, in an industry like fantasy football, where normally you would have had to, you know, gone to college to be a journalist or an on-camera personality, and then work your way up the ranks, 
there are a lot of other ways to do it now. And I'd imagine, you know, when these companies such as ESPN or these other companies are looking to hire new faces, new young faces, yeah, maybe they'll go to the colleges that they trust and ask for resumes, or they might find someone on Twitter who has 30,000 followers who has built a brand that hasn't gone to college yet. So coming from someone who has almost, you know, you did the college thing and whatnot, and you put your work in and have the experience in that sense. What are your thoughts on that in terms of like, how important it is to build a personal brand now? And you know, what kind of like advice can you give to the younger folks who might think about taking the college path versus trying to build their influence or just, you know, open conversation, because it's a super interesting topic that I like to think about. I think they, I think they both have value um, for different reasons. I, I needed college to grow up. Uh, I needed college for life experience. I needed college uh, to develop a lot of the relationships I have. Yep. Um, I, I, for me, college was an opportunity to really start building my brand. And that was always how I viewed that. Uh, I, I used, I used college to take internships. I used college to make mistakes. Um, I used college to learn, uh, to grow, to network. I mean, a lot of all the guys that I've dropped so far, those are relationships I've developed when I was 18 and 19 years old at the university of Nebraska. Now that's not to say that you, you can't make it without going to school. But if I'm talking to a 17 year old, like let's say you're 17 and you're thinking about what path to go. I think you have to go to school and you have to learn the basics of journalism. You have to learn how to write. You have to learn how to be on camera. You have to learn how to podcast, but you have to take advantage of that time while you're in school, because listen, you're, you can go to school and you can do the bare minimum and you can barely get by. Um, and you're not going to, you're not going to succeed. Uh, you're just not going to, especially in an industry where guess what? Everybody, all my friends would love to have my job. All of them, mm -hmm. period. End of sentence. Uh, so to, to stand out, to do what you want to do, you gotta, you gotta work extra hard, um, because there's, there's a lot of competition to do what we do. And that doesn't mean you can't do it. it just means you gotta be ready to put in, put in the amount of effort that it takes to do that. And, yeah. and building your personal brand in tandem while going to school and learning and making mistakes, that's exactly what I did. And it worked out <coughs> extremely successfully for me. Um, there are still relationships today. Uh, I, as I said, I'm 29 that I developed 10 years ago while I was in school that are just now coming around to be something that materializes into something that's going to be successful and helpful for me in my career. And I have so, anytime I meet somebody from Nebraska, it's an instantaneous it, it, without fail. It's like, oh, we trust each other now. Yeah. <laughs> we went to school together or we know the same people or we can talk about that stuff. It, it, it matters. Um, and so if I'm talking to a 17 year old, that's my advice. If I'm talking to somebody who's in their mid to late twenties, you know, or they're out of school already and it's their passion, that's where it's a different conversation, right? You, mm -hmm. you're not going to go back to school. Um, I'm not going to tell you to go spend money on another degree. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense from a financial d d uh, position. But what I am going to tell you to do is start building a personal brand Start building on social, podcasting, video, and do the same thing you're doing. Start bothering people like me on social media for advice, for opportunities. Hey, I'll work for free. Hey, I'll do this. Hey, I'll do that. You might have to throw 100 to get two back, but that's what you got to do. You're in a, it's a tougher position when you're in that spot. Yeah. Not impossible, but just tougher. Um, so I think it's two different conversations depending on where you are in your life and, and whether or not you know, you're young and you're looking to go to college or you're out of college already. And you're like, Hey, what I went to school for isn't my passion. I'd like to do something else. And I want to get into sports. Um, either way it's possible, just two different conversations. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting topic and something you brought up, like you said, when you were that young, like, you know, what a 17, 18, 19 in college that helped you grow up. And that's kind of the way I look at it too. I'm like, College is not necessarily something you need. I don't think every young person needs to go there for me. Like I, uh, I graduated with an international business degree, none of which I use now in a practical, you know, version, but like college taught me a lot of like personal growth things that I wouldn't be the person who I am. It teaches you organization skills. It teaches you communication skills, all these kind of things that you need to succeed in the real world. But the way I look at it in terms of like learning your craft, 
you know, the internet is there. So that eliminates the middleman. You could do something like I do where I, I, you know, if a media company came to me and were like, we want to hire you because you built a personal brand, I would turn that down in a second because I would prefer building my own brand and then trying to evolve that into a business. You could do that or you could build a personal brand to leverage that to work for a media company, right? That something like you do, you work for any number of, you know, you could do your research and figure out what you want to do. I think there's a lot of paths, but I think we live in such an interesting time that, you know, these middlemen are not there to kind of X out what they don't think should be hitting the consumers. And at the end of the day, like the market is the market and the market is going to decide whether or not you're good. So you could take a, a ton of different paths. And I was someone kind of how you mentioned where I wasn't really doing this when I was in college. Once I got out, I was like 22, 23. And I realized like, that's really what I want to do. And, you know, it, it takes so much time to build something like this up. Like I've been really chipping away and doing things that were r- ridiculous and like make me cringe when I look back at it, at, at, like my 22 year old self. But like, those are the things you need to do and do dumb shit and, and learn from that in order to get there. So it's really like a five or six year process for me as well. Um, and when I was that age, I was like, oh my God, 26, I'm 26 now. I was like, 26 years old is so old. Like I better have my shit together by then. And I'm, I'm 26 and I feel about as young as I've, I've ever felt in my life right now, you know, and, and I'm sure you feel the same way at, at 29. So it's like, if you're going to start, it's really never too late to start doing it because, you know, you don't have to wait for someone's permission in, in the world that we kind of, um, in the world that we live in now. Yeah, I, listen, I, like, I, it's a life conversation. Like it's not a fantasy football conversation, it's a life conversation. Uh-huh. Like at the end of the day, like you got to do you're going to put a lot more effort into something that you have purpose and passion in. Right. And I I think that's, I'm a big conversation person on that. Like, listen, it's, it's not only about loving sports. It's about having a purpose and having a passion and paving your way, um, and getting your way through. And sometimes that comes most of the time, if not all the time, it comes with some adversity and some people, you know, everybody can handle it. Some people just handle it a little bit better. Um, and I would say you, if you're going to get into this industry, no matter what, you have to be tough and you have to be ready to, to take criticism. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to be ready to be able to go through adversity because I the, the product that I am today is not the product that I was five years ago or 10 years ago. And it's not the product that's going to be two months from now. You should always be getting better and learning and getting better at your craft. It's just a lot easier to get better at something that you actually enjoy. So you're going to actually put much more effort into something you're passionate about. And it may... It may start with, hey, I'm in finance and I got to do this eight hours a day. And then in my free time, I'm doing a podcast and you build up that podcast to a point where you start making money off of that. And then you scale back in your finance world and you go full time on your podcast world. I mean, fantasy footballers are a great example of that. Uh, They're they're doing exceptionally well for themselves and none of them were doing sports journalism or any of that stuff. They came together and it's good chemistry and it's fun and they do their research and look at where they are. So if they can do it, uh, anybody can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really about having that self-awareness and I kind of bring this up on every episode I have of this. It's like knowing what you, how you said, like you might need to work that eight to five and then grind on your, you know, your other free hours, whether that's seven to midnight or whatever it is. <clears throat> Some people might have more leverage. If you are really um, okay with, you know, if you're 26 years old and you want to take on a part-time job in order to just pay for your expenses to do the podcast, that's very reasonable as well. I know that's going to cause a lot of stigma in today's society because people care a lot about what other people think about them. And they're like, why are you 26 working a full uh, part-time job doing a podcast? But like, if that's how you see your life going, you can't be afraid to, you know, make those changes and, and really go after those things. Because if you're not fully committed to where you want to be or have a good plan, at least to get there, then it's going to be um, very, very tough to do so. Yeah. Who cares? Why do you care? what other? I, 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 you have nothing to lose. No. You really don't. I, I, I never understand. I have so many this would turn into a life conversation very quickly, but my entire life I have been told by my family, by, by people that are super close to me that are supposed to be supportive that I can't do what I want to do, that I'm going to fail at what I'm going to do, that I should stay, that I should do this, that I should do that, that I should take the safe route. Um, and I always took the risky route. And sometimes I made, sometimes it sucked and sometimes it it didn't. And I, I think there isn't one decision though that I've made that I would go back and change. There just isn't. That's, and and yeah. I think it's super important to know that not every decision I made turned out. Um, so there are going to be times where you take the risky route and it 
it ends up being a big fail. But you have to be willing to do that because if you don't, you're never going to have the success that you that you really, really want. And, and I think if you're trying to please everybody else, good luck with that. That's not it, it, you're never going to please everybody. So you got to make yourself happy and, and everybody else can fall in line as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And when you're trying to do something that's like kind of out of the ordinary and i would say going after something like fantasy football is definitely out of the ordinary and people will be like uh what's going on with that you know the people that really don't support you are probably not the people that are going to be around you know when you do make it down the line and i'll say like listen for anyone that's starting off anything like you're gonna feel that weird like should i do this like this feels weird it's uncomfortable (laughs) it's gonna give you those really 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 hard insecurities and you're like i don't know like where i'm at right but for the people out there that are starting like just know that anyone who's made it had those efforts too like everyone is going to go through those no one goes into you know you don't hit like create youtube channel and then be like okay like i'm a boss here now you know what i mean it takes a (laughs) long time to build that stuff up and you're going to have a lot of pushback in the beginning but just just know i think that's like the big talk here is just to know that that is a normal a normal feeling to have now something that is not normal nice little segue right here is um, you are one of very few people within the fantasy football industry that is a female that has a large influence. Now, you know, it's really interesting because you see like 99% of people are males and most of them are, you know, you can't differentiate one from the other because in in fantasy football, it's like 45 year old white men. And it's like, that guy looks like this guy and everyone's the same, you know? So tell me a little bit about, you probably get this question all the time. I'm sure just being in in sports and being a woman, was it difficult coming? Would you say there were pros and cons or would you just say straight out? It was just way more difficult as a woman trying to build your influence. Uh, Pros and cons. Uh, I think, the pro is that I'm different, right. um, and I've always taken being different as a good thing. Uh, I think that people that focus on being different and make it into a bad thing, that's a you thing. It's not an everybody else thing. Um, I have always used being a female in the sports space as a advantage, um, and I've always thought of it as, hey, it's, it's my opportunity to have a different voice, to have a different view, to have a different opinion, um, and, and I think that that's the best way that you can go about it. The cons are from a from what I cannot control, right? Because what I can control is how I feel. What I can't control is how everybody else feels. Uh, there's a certain amount of pressure that comes with being a female in sports because I can bring a perfect example of Stephen A. Smith getting on TV and absolutely butchering the names, the players, the people. If a female had done that, it would be a disaster. Yep. I remember when it happened in Sarah Spain and and a lot of the females that I that I know really well, we all took offense to it because we're like, listen, this is – you want to know what the difference is in the space? We can't do that. We can't make mistakes because the second that we do, every dude on social media is like, you don't know shit about sports. You don't know this. You don't know that. And, and it's – there's less opportunity to make mistakes, whereas with guys, it's like, well – he probably made a mistake or he, he played sports. So it's fine. Right? Like it, it, there isn't even a conversation where most of the guys that I work with, I'm way more athletic than like way, <laughs> way, way more athletic than I believe like, it. I believe I it. Throw football farther than them. I'm faster than them. Like it doesn't. So I think for, from that perspective, like I get it. I didn't play football, but that doesn't mean I don't understand football. Like that's such a stupid thing to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it doesn't mean it just makes my voice unique. And I look at the game differently. Um, and, and I think that's, that's the, the pro for me has always been, what can I control in this situation? What I can control is viewing this as an opportunity to differentiate my voice, to differentiate the opinion that I have, to come in and use this to my advantage. It's like, hey, I'm different and that's good, right? I deserve a seat at the table because I am not the 45-year-old white guy. I bring, in, I bring something different to the table. You have six 45-year-old white guys who all look the same, talk the same, and act the same. I have a different opinion. Um, and I've, I've always used that as leverage to differentiate and, and, and have myself as, as somebody who a, a positive thing. Mm-hmm. The con is there's less opportunities to make mistakes. Uh, your social media stuff, you better just get over it now. Like I tell <laughs> girls that yeah. all the time. I go, listen, you better just get over everybody's stupid opinion on social media right now because there are plenty of 
old dudes on social media that cannot get over the fact that there is a woman talking about sports and it is mind blowing to them. And that is fine. And if they want to hit me up on social and be a jerk, that's their prerogative. And I don't care. You just have to get over it. It used to hurt my feelings. And then I had about two days of feeling bad for myself. (laughs) And then I was like, I have my own friends. I have my family. Like I don't need more friends and family. Like I have plenty of people that love me and I, care about their opinions. I really don't care what Joe on Twitter has to say. So sorry. Like if you're going to be a jerk, you're just going to get blocked. Yeah. And I think like, yeah, it's like going on like social comments and those kind of things. Like you're always right. You're not going to be for everyone. So naturally you're always going to get some kind of asshole on Twitter, like replying to what you say in like the worst manner. But like, as someone who gets those comments, you really have to step back and be like, dude, if someone's on Twitter tweeting these things, like they have some really bad shit going on in their life, probably, right? You just have to have, you have to have empathy towards that because obviously they're not mad at you. They're mad at like something that's going on in their life and just taking it out on you. So that's kind of the way, that's the way I look at those comments. Like if, you know, if they're actual constructive criticism, I'm all, I'm all fine with having like a, a real conversation. But if you're like coming out the gates, hot, firing like really irrelevant shit at me then that's i'm just like this is absurd and i'll probably just start messing around with the person and like trying to get them a little more angry just i don't know why because it's entertaining to me but yeah i mean that's that's a great way to look at it um and you're saying like you know only worry about things that you can control like dwelling on things that you can't control is what holds a lot of people back i think man you got to understand like everyone's going to have advantages everyone's going to have disadvantages the people that are going to overcome them are the ones that like don't care about them, you know, are, are the yeah, ones that sure. that just kind of push through. Um, that was a really good point with Stephen A. Smith. I, I hadn't really even thought about that. But yeah, you guys have pretty much one lifeline in terms of your public credibility. Um, and that's a really shitty, shitty si- situation because, yeah, I've, I've seen your work and you're as good as 90 percent of the, you know, the guys that are out there. So it's not like um, it's 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 a shitty it's a shitty stigma that we have, you know, going throughout the public, but I, I kind of like where we're going as a society right now, sure. you know? And 100%. yeah. And the other thing is for me, like I've always just used it. I've tried, I always try and take things, like I said, as, as things that are out of my control, right? Like I can't control how public perception is or how we view men versus women in the, in the workplace or in the sports space, for instance, but I've used it as like, use Tom Brady as a great example, like being looked over, being passed up, being thought, being thought of as an underdog, um, just use it as a chip on your shoulder. I always have. I've just, I've used it as an opportunity to say, I'm going to outwork you, I'm going to out hustle you, and I'm going to be better than you. And I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a guy or a girl, old or young. Um, I use it as a competitive advantage, like the ultimate chip on your shoulder. Like I take it personally when I mess up. Like I want, I want my advice to be the best advice. I want to make everybody that listens to my podcast and follows me on social media win every fantasy football league. Like I want to be the best and I use it as a chip on my shoulder that hasn't gone away. Like it doesn't, and it's not going to, I I use it as constant motivation to be like, listen, if you're going to doubt me because I'm a girl, I am so going to prove you wrong Mm -hmm. that you're going to be embarrassed that you didn't take my (laughs) fantasy advice because you listen to some other Jamoke who doesn't know what he's talking about. So you, so it gets personal with you, huh? Oh yeah. I know it's my nickname on Twitter is petty page. Like it's (laughs) 100%. Like there's, you can't take the Greek, the Greek out of me. Like I'm a very passionate person and I have like a super strict, very, very overprotective dad that I've always battled with and has made me super strong. And same with like my brother, like I grew up with boys. So like I got beat up and I was forced to be tough at a young age. So I just, I learned how to, how to be tough and how to hang with the boys. And it's never intimidated me. It's always just made me be like, I'm going to prove you wrong. And I think, there's listen the greatest football player that ever lived is still using it as motivation even after his sixth freaking super bowl so if he can do it <laughs> yeah everybody else can okay i'll make sure i address you as petty page from now on on, uh, on twitter <laughs> now you said um you know one of the pros of, of being female in this industry is that you have that natural um differentiation right you don't even need to really go above and beyond for that because you already are different than most of the people in there now, this is a theme that comes up also on every one of these episodes. And really, it's like to get your name out there, to get anywhere you're going, you have to be different than what's, you know, come before you. Is there anything like any, I guess, pieces of advice for people out there that, uh, you know, 
are trying to find, you know, it's easy to say you have to differentiate yourself, but it's hard to really go out there and, and do that. You know, are, are there any like tips or pieces of advice that maybe you can give to someone on how they maybe go about finding like what differentiates them? Yeah. Just be authentic, be genuine. Like nobody is Facts. the same as <laughs> any other person. So if you stop trying to be something that you aren't and you actually just embrace who you are, whatever that is, um, and are just authentic and genuine, that in, in and of itself is going to differentiate you. Listen, the social space is full of a bunch of fake idiots, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> They're trying to be something that they desperately, desperately are not. So this world in general craves authenticity. That in and of itself is going to make you different. So just be genuine to who you are and embrace whatever makes you you. And if you stop trying to be Andy from the footballers or Paige from TD fantasy or Matt Barry from ESPN and are just Joe from Cincinnati, then you're going to be fine because everybody, so many people, I'd say like 80% of people on social media, specifically like Instagram, right. Are just <laughs> trying to be yeah. freaking Kim Kardashian. Okay. It's like the worst. It's like, it's the worst, and none of them are Kim Kardashian, and I don't even know why she's famous to begin with. Like, it's really stupid. I could tell so, you why. Yeah. I mean, well, that's a different podcast that we'll have to do, but <laughs> it's, it's, the reality is, like, being pretty doesn't make you a good person. Being handsome or whatever, none of those things matter. Like, it, be genuine to who you are, be authentic to who you are, and treat people well. Like, it's really not that hard, and if you do all of those things – you're already ahead of literally 80% of people. Yeah. So just do just do that, just be yourself and you'll be just fine. Yeah, be yourself, be nice, work hard and and like Paige said before, like when you're in my position and you're just reaching out to a bunch of people, you'll realize that people are are very nice. Like people are genuinely uh, willing to help you out even if, you know, sometimes, you know, you're not you're going to get people who ignore you, don't answer you, but if you try to talk to 10, 15, 20 people to get advice or to get them on your podcast or your channel or whatever, you know, there will be a couple in there that will have no problem without you having to give value back to them, help you out because maybe they see some of you in um, some of themselves in you. And they're like, Oh, you're starting out. I would love to, you know, help you out and give you some advice, um, things like that. So really like, don't be shy when it comes to reaching out to people. Cause for the most part, people are willing, willing to help. Um, now, being a more social person uh, like you are, I would imagine that's one of the many, you know, drawing factors for you when it comes to fantasy football. I know you said you like to interact with the players because it's something different for them. But for you personally, when you're playing fantasy, is the social aspect of it the best part for you? Like, do you only play in redraft leagues or have you, do you play in like any best ball dynasty leagues? Like, uh, give me your breakdown on, you know, on what kind of leagues you're playing in uh, in fantasy. Yeah, I play in a bunch of different leagues. So I play in a dynasty league that I've had since I was 16. So it's what? it's been going for a while. Like it's been going and that's probably, that's my most competitive league just because it's all people that we've been friends with. Like we've been friends forever. So it's it's super highly competitive. Um, this year I played in a like fantasy host league with like Brad Evans and Liz Loza and uh, a bunch of those people. Um, and we played just in a regular standard like PPR half, half point league. Um, which was fun. I, I played in best ball tournaments through uh, Scout Fantasy. I've kind of done everything. Yeah. Um, my favorite, personally, if you're in it for the long term, I just like the Dynasty League because it creates kind of um, – people just pay closer attention, I feel, like than, than with the year the leagues that are one and done because – if you're if you're playing, you kind of have to continue to, to to pay attention. Even if you're out of contention, you have to be figuring out like, okay, like is there anybody uh, that I can trade to make to keep for next season? Are there guys who I know I can leverage? Like, okay, this guy's one running back away from being great in the postseason, so I'm gonna trade him my running back and get back a really good piece that I'm gonna keep for my next year's team. So I think for me, that's why I like dynasty leagues the best. Um, but I really I. I I like it all. Like I don't yeah. really have, uh, 
I, I don't really have a like uh, opinion on what I what I the only thing that I don't like is not having like I like PPR half point standard leagues. Like I think that's that's the best way to play. Um, I don't like playing standard leagues because it's so running back heavy nah. uh, that it that it that it makes it to me it doesn't reflect what the NFL actually is. Um, so I I think. A full PPR point, too, is almost too much towards wide receivers, so I like the half-point PPR. I think it's exactly what it should be, and it usually balances out to make sure that the equal across the board are, are all involved and all have the proper amount of influence in, in, in what makes your team good. Well said. That's the correct answer. If I had a soundboard, I'd give you a little ding, ding, ding. We are definitely <laughs> uh, we are definitely team half PPR over here. I also think, since you touched on you know making the game more realistic to – how the NFL game is played, I think super flex leagues are almost a must, uh, a must do going forward. That's, you know, for yeah. people that have never played in them, that's when you have a quarterback and then you have a flex spot in which you can start another quarterback. And, you know, you pretty much have to, because um, they're putting up, you know, their floor is just as good as most running back ceilings and things like that. So uh, I, I love that because that evens out, it makes quarterbacks kind of important again, which they haven't been for, for forever. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, that's wait, hold on. So you've been playing in a dynasty league since you were 16. What platform even, yes. I didn't even know they were around since that long ago. What platform did they, did you start that on? We started on ESPN. So ESPN is the only, uh, functionality. I don't even know if like Yahoo or any of those guys were doing it, but we had to do a lot of stuff manually. Okay. Uh, and a lot of stuff we had to keep up. My dad used to play fantasy football, which is amazing. My dad used to play fantasy football where we'd have to call his buddy and set his picks so his buddy was the commissioner, right? Jeez. And he would keep track of all the players. <laughs> uh -huh. So imagine, like, my dad is legitimately, fantasy, him and his buddies, fantasy football hipsters. Like, they were That's playing legit. without any technology. They were calling in their picks. They were making sure they were calling in what players they were going to start and what they were going to do. And they had little sheets, almost like pick em leagues now, um, but doing it all for fantasy football. So, like, yeah, my league is cool, but, like, what my dad was doing before I was even born is insane. Like, yeah, dude, that like, sounds. He's been, playing, he's been playing fantasy before anybody else was playing fantasy football, which has probably had quite a little bit of influence on why I like it so much. Yeah, that sounds miserable. I'm the commissioner of like four of my leagues, and I'd want to kill myself on Sundays if I had to. Like, yeah, that's too much, man. Yeah, that's so much. It's Being so. The commissioner is the worst. Negotiate your ways. One piece of advice. Fantasy owners, negotiate your way out of being the commissioner. Greatest, greatest piece of advice I can I possibly give you. It's very true, but I, I don't know. I like having the control and the power. I like For to. Sure. I, I get it. I like to think I'm a, I'm a fair commissioner. You probably have to ask my league mates if that's true or not, but I think I run a pretty democratic system. I'm a, I'm a fan of Dynasty, though. I, I've gotten into it in recent years, um, and I'll definitely be doing a few startup drafts. So stay tuned, audience, because I will be having some subscriber leagues open. Um, <clears throat> now, this was something that I had heard about this prior to reaching out to you, and I had no idea that you were even involved in this. <laughs> And this is fantasy football at sea. Can you just give the audience a breakdown of what this is? Yeah, so this is the first ever fantasy football cruise. Uh, it leaves, it's in August. It leaves out of Miami and goes to the Bahamas for four days. Um, it is myself, Pilar Lastra, who works for Sirius XM, Adam Ronis, from Scout Fantasy, Jake Arians, who works with me uh, at TD Fantasy, myself, Andre Reed, former Bills player, obviously a Hall of Famer. There's a couple of other players that are to be named, which I actually am, I can't release yet, but maybe I'll release them to you at a, at a later time, okay. uh, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, and it's going to be panels, expert advice, Scout Fantasy is going to be involved and heavily. Um, and if you're really, really into fantasy, you're familiar with scout fantasy because they're they've been doing this stuff for a long time they have a huge tournament in vegas that's highly competitive and really really fun mm -hmm. um so we're gonna be doing a little bit of everything we're gonna be doing a private uh bill's mafia tailgate oh, on, a pri on a private island in <laughs> uh in coco Cay uh that royal caribbean owns we're probably gonna have some drinks we're probably going to have some fun, yeah. um, and we're probably all going to get a nice tan. So I think the the basis of this is if you like fantasy football, you like drinks, you like fun, you like friends, you like meeting new people, um, and you want to take your fantasy football experience to the next level. That's what this is all about. Uh, so if you're the if you're the group, the the commissioner of a league that goes to Vegas, 
this is the year you go, hey, uh, let's take Vegas uh, on steroids and <laughs> let's let's go to the Bahamas. Uh, and that's that's kind of what what the whole thought process behind this is. And I'm really excited. It's gonna be it's gonna be a hell of a time. I'm gonna, not gonna have any fun. <laughs> Sounds miserable. I would never want to go. <laughs> What, uh, is this the second year doing it? Have you done it before? No, this is the first year. They were going to do mm. it last year, but then they ended up postponing it because some of the athletes that they had involved uh, were not, like, coming along or had something that happened. So I just got involved a few months ago um, with helping them uh, influence and market with it. So this is the first year it's going to happen. Uh, Royal Caribbean out of Miami to Nassau, Coco uh ship uh, cruise day, and then back back to Miami. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm very excited. Yeah, it sounds awesome. So like when I was looking into different questions to ask you, I came across the tweet that you had put out asking, you know, you made a video, you're like, oh, I asked my audience, you know, what kind of fantasy draft you would want to have this this summer. And it's kind of funny because uh, I did something like this and I was, I was, I, uh, you know, I think as the fantasy football industry gets more and more popular, we're going to see more live events like the fantasy footballers have done. How they went like on tour, you know, and kind of like yeah. sold out these stadiums to do episodes there. This previous summer, I actually had uh, nine of my subscribers fly out from all around the country, and we got an Airbnb in New York City, and we like kicked it from Friday to Sunday. It was like a penthouse. It was so cool. It was people from uh, three people from California, Virginia, Carolina, Texas, like all over the place, and. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, it was so cool. It was such a good time to finally meet some of some of the like subscribers that have been there, um, been there for so long. And I, I saw like in that video, someone um, actually mentioned that they were like, "Yeah, get an Airbnb for the weekend and have like a live draft." And that's exactly what we did. And it, it was uh, it was really fun. It turned it turned into like a crazy weekend that I would have just had with my friends, which was super cool because everyone that came was like was awesome. And I'm hoping to do it. What I want to do is open it up for multiple weekends this summer now that we've had one successful one i want to do maybe yeah. two or three in a row um but planning uh, a live event the logistics behind it are extremely fucking difficult really 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 hard um now you, your title is a director for fantasy football at sea now you said you're involved with doing a lot of the marketing work are you involved with setting up um any of the logistics in terms of like you know, I mean, I'm sure a million customers or whatever are going to like be reaching out, asking questions about, you know, when do I go here? How do we do this? Blah, 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 blah. Are you, are you involved in any of that stuff? Uh, thankfully, no. So we have, uh, we were contracted TD Fantasy to kind of be in charge of helping market and be a part of the cruise and do all that. But there is a, a lady who has done these cruises before. She's never done a fantasy football cruise, but she does many other themed cruises. So she's kind of got this whole thing down pat. She knows okay. <laughs> what days what days things are happening. She's got all the connections with the cruise line. She knows what vendors they're using, what parties are going to happen, what events are happening. So we were just contracted to her to just say, hey, this is what we know works in the fantasy space. What can we do on Royal Caribbean? And it was just a, a you know coming together over, hey, this is a, a lot of people love playing fantasy football. Everybody loves going on vacation. <laughs> Let's figure out a really cool way to do this. And, and that's, that's what we've done. Yeah. That's so, that's so cool. That's, it's so innovative in this industry. And it's like, at such a, a beginning level of where I think it's going, because, you know, I asked you like, do you like redraft or dynasty or best ball? And that's like one part of, you know, separating fantasy itself, but there's also so many different things that you can do again to separate yourself. Like no one, had done what, what I did last summer, right? And it's, you yeah. didn't even need, I had an audience of like 8,000 to 10,000 people at the time. I needed nine people to come and we had like a blast of a weekend and now you're gonna see these live events become more and more of, uh, of a piece of the industry, I think, it, you know, and that's something that you see in other industries. And I think starting to think outside the box and say, hey, this works in, in this industry or this works in this market, why don't we try to, um, you know, move it into our industry and see if it, yeah. see if it works. I think that's, we're going to see a lot of like really, really cool, innovative things, um, you know, shift towards what we're doing. And it's, I mean, the fantasy football at sea sounds crazy. That's, I asked because I'm like, how do you even go about like starting to organize that? Like, who do you contact at like a, a, a cruise <laughs> center? You know, like I want to bring all yeah. these nuts. Yeah. No, it's luckily, luckily for me, it was somebody reaching out to me about, Hey, we have this concept we want you know, kind of influencers in the space to be involved, you know, how can you help? And I was like, yeah, I mean, that sounds awesome. Let's do it. Right. So we might have to talk uh, offline. Maybe we can get you involved in what we're doing. 
I'm all in. I'm all in on that. <laughs> my friend, I told my friend that you were coming on my channel and he knew that you had been like involved with this. He's like, bro, if you don't, if you don't get on that cruise ship, <laughs> like you, you failed the interview. I was like, damn. All right. So we'll talk offline about that. Um, so I kind of want to circle back on, on the whole social aspect of things and you personally, now you're someone who, you know, has a pretty big following on both like Instagram and on, on Twitter and you do these podcasts and I've seen you, you know, be a guest on a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different places and shows. Now, are you one of those people that just like kind of say yes to everything? How do you manage your time? Because that's really difficult. Once you start building a platform, you're going to have a lot of people reaching out. And like I said, some people will say yes, some people will say no, but as the person being asked, how do you manage your time? Because creating content can take a long time. And I know you need to be in a lot of places at a lot of times. So, um, so how do you, how do you work around that? Yeah, I can't say yes to everything. If I said yes to everything, I wouldn't actually do my job. I'd just be on other people's podcasts and videos throughout, <laughs> throughout the week. So especially during fantasy season, right? Especially during the NFL season. Unfortunately, there's a lot of times where I just have to go, listen, I've got, I have to value my time. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's, it's never personal, and I always try and get back to people and say, hey, listen, right now I'm super busy. Hit me up in the off season and let's try and make something work. Yep. Um, uh, and I think that's, from my perspective, it's, it's just about valuing my time and knowing that I can't possibly do everything. But I also, on the flip side, know that when I was first getting started, I was that person asking, hey, can you do this? Hey, can you do that? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times what I offer up if I can't, make a podcast work or I can't make something else work. I say, Hey, why don't you shoot me an email, ask me a few questions and I would love to help you out, give you advice, put your resume out there, um, and, and help them in that way. Or I'll follow up and say, Hey, I'm busy right now, but keep bothering me. You know, mm -hmm. I always give people the up. I go, keep bothering me, stay on top of me. If I don't respond, it's not cause I didn't want to, it's cause I either saw it and forgot or I didn't see it at all. So I think from that perspective, like I value my time, but I also value knowing that like that was me at some point. Mm -hmm. So I like to remember like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta get back because plenty of people helped me out when I was first going through it. Yeah, exactly. Like I said before, it's like, you kind of see a little bit of yourself and the people who are just starting and like those people need to know that everyone has been, you know, at, at that um, point. And that's a reaction or a response I heard from a lot of people that I've reached out to, um, they'll be like, Hey, listen, I'm super busy right now, but just like, keep bothering me, keep bothering me and we'll eventually get it. And like, I interviewed Brad Evans, uh, as one of the episodes on this, on this series. And I had to like, I, I had bothered him for like weeks on Twitter and he kept being like next week, I'm super busy this week, whatever, whatever. And uh, finally he was like, yeah, this Thursday I can do it. And I happened to be in Mexico at the time. I was at an all-inclusive resort with like my friends. And I was like, it was like 2 p.m. And I was like in, in the middle of drinking margaritas. But I went up to my room. I bought like the yeah, Wi-Fi yeah. package, got it done. Yeah, it was such a fun episode. But like those are the things, you know, you got to really like be willing to uh, to get it done. And, you know, people are going to help you out with these things. You just have to stay on top. And I would also say if you're reaching out to someone, like make sure you get as specific as possible. Like, yes, what are you, nice. what are you trying to accomplish here? Don't be like, Hey, can you come on my podcast? Like that, you know, that, that just gives more work for the person on for the sure. other side. Cause then they're like, yeah. what are we talking? What am I trying to bring value to? Like all that stuff. Yeah. I'll tell you that's a non-starter for me. If that's what you're, if that's your response, like, Hey, can you come on my pod? Like it's not happening. Like, yeah. I don't know who you are. I've never talked to you before. I have no idea what your podcast is about. And there's way too many people who put way more effort into asking me and telling me about what they're doing that I, I had. That's a, that's, that's the differentiating point, right? Yep. Because if I tell, if I told, if I did those podcasts, I would literally have no life. So those are the, <laughs> those are the ones that it's easy to eliminate. It's like, Hey, you got to put in a little bit more effort because you're asking me to do you a favor. So right. if you want, if you want people to do you a favor, you got to make it easy on them. And also understand that like, you have to be flexible. Like when I was first starting out, like it was like, Hey, can this guy come on my podcast? If he was like, Hey, this time doesn't work. And I'm like, well, you know, like I was going to go out with my friends and I wanted to do this. I other thing. sometimes you got to sacrifice a little bit. Yeah, uh, for sure. Especially if you're, especially if you're like you did, like, you sacrifice, you're in Mexico, like, listen, like, it's an hour of your time, like, you'll, mm -hmm. it's worth it, uh, and you develop the relationship, and if you're constantly like, well, I'm too busy then, or that time doesn't work for me, like, those people are not going to give you their time, because they just, they don't have to, yeah. um, and so, you, you just got to be flexible, and you also got to put in, put in a little effort, so that way, when they are getting the message, they know you're serious, and that it's not just like, hey, I really want you on my pod, okay, cool, so, w what's your podcast? 
Like, I, yeah. I'm not going to do that work, so you got to let me know. Exactly, because, like, when I reached out to you, I DM'd you. We had never spoken before, weren't, like, really following each other, you know, and, like, yeah. bantering back and forth. But I wrote out, like, multiple paragraphs explaining exactly what it was, and, and it was, like, personal to you. And, you know... Yeah. When you are starting out, obviously you you have no leverage with the people that have a bigger influence than you, and it sucks to hear, but it's like it's the truth. And if you put in that effort, that can sometimes substitute itself in for the value. Because if someone were to reach out to me and be like, "Nick, I'm a huge fan. I've been following you on YouTube for like two and a half years, and blah, you know this and that and the other thing," like that will give me a, a much more like soft spot for you than Absolutely. someone who doesn't put the effort in. Um, so just know that if you are starting out and you want to try to reach out to someone. Um, for those kind of things like that, that is another way to do that without being able to, uh, you know, directly provide value for that person. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So those are most of the questions I have for you. Now I did find a quote in one of these articles. Oh boy. I found a quote and I want you to, I want you to guess who said this and okay. Afterwards, I wanna I wanna hear what this what this quote would mean to you. So, okay. I set my sights on AZ Sports. They're an ESPN affiliate. I told myself that I wanted to work for them within a year. I had a vision board, and AZ Sports was on there. Every day, I would wake up and look at it and ask myself, "What steps am I taking to do this?" I didn't have a life for about a year. I did nothing but go to games and network with media people. It was a bumpy ride, and I made a lot of mistakes, but I learned a lot and I got better. I did everything. I did video. I did radio. I did podcasting. I was writing. I was doing social media. Now, do you do you know who said that? Yeah, that was me. There you go. <laughs> so this was this was a very like this this quote really stuck out to me, and uh, it was it was an inspirational quote for me for sure because a lot of people look at inspiration from like a rah rah whatever point of view, but to me like inspiration comes from people like you who you know put the work in and work their ass off. And within that quote, you know, you hit on like five different topics. You're like, I didn't have a life for a year. I was doing everything, podcasting, video, whatever. Like looking back on that quote, I know you laughed a couple times, but like, does that, you know, did that give you like goosebumps? Does that resonate with you still? Oh, it definitely resonates. Why it resonates is because there's a lot of people who are full of shit about inspiration, okay? Inspiration is doing things, not Back. talking about doing things. And there's a lot of people who are really good at talking about doing shit. And then there's people who do shit. Uh, there's like, like I always like laugh, but like real G's move in silence like lasagna. Like I always go back to <laughs> little Wayne. Like, yeah. <laughs> you, if you're actually doing shit, you're not talking about it. It's not on Instagram where you're like, oh, my hustle is real. And this, that, <laughs> and the other thing. No, if you're hustling, you're not talking about hustling. You mm -hmm. are hustling. Mm -hmm. Actually, yep. actually out, out in the workplace. The first year of my life in Arizona was a bumpy ride to be, to be like, I mean, it's not, we could get into, we could do a whole podcast on what the first year was like, right? <laughs> yeah. I lived with my aunt and uncle. They had four kids. I split a bedroom with my 16 year old cousin. Okay. What 22 year old female wants to be splitting a bedroom with a 16 year old? No one. I'll tell you that. Uh, I had no life. I had no friends in a new city. I spent all of my – any waking free time that I had uh, either working out or spending time with my family. Um, I went to every single professional sport in the Valley trying to network, trying to make connections. Um, I went to all four pro sports teams. I went to ASU. I drove to Tucson, went to U of A. Um, any opportunity that I could – put myself into networking events, um, anything that was even had a 1% chance of me meeting somebody uh, to help me out, I was going. Um, I did every radio spot. I did every podcast. <laughs> I answered everybody on social media. It was the year of yes. I just <laughs> said yes, and I just did all of, everything that – I just said yes. And I went, and I did it, and I learned, and I failed, and I and I grew, and I got better. And, and my goal was like, hey, like I know in Phoenix – the biggest media market, the biggest media company here is Arizona Sports. I want to work for them. And as you all know, as history writes, not only did not only did I work for them, but I grew with them for three years. I started all of their social. I hosted a fantasy football show there. Um, I had some of my best years there. And, it, and I was able to walk away from Arizona Sports and go, I did everything I could. Like I did, I did, I maximized this job and this moment and and it started off part-time and it worked into, I was 
I was so full time that I had to leave so that I could do more. Um, <laughs> and, and that's, that's kind of, that's the, the real inspiration. The yeah. real inspiration is actually doing shit. It's not talking about it. It's not reading books about it. It's not posting Gary V quotes about it. <laughs> it's actually going out and doing shit. And I think most people are just waiting, sitting on their couch, waiting for something to inspire them. And you have to inspire yourself because if you, if you don't, if you don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for you. Not Gary V, not the, whatever podcast you're listening to, not whatever radio show you're listening to, not what, what Winston Churchill quote you read, <laughs> whatever. Like, you have to do it for yourself. So if you can't do it for yourself, nobody's going to. So that's, that's the long and short of the inspiration. Drop yeah, the mic. My job. That was good. Yeah. Well, first of all, I fucking love Gary V by the way. He's the man. He's, He's probably one of my biggest inspirations. I would never like start posting his quotes on my Instagram, but I get what you mean. So the grind was. Uh... I, I love Gary, I love Gary, but he grinds and he has oh, yeah. always grinded, and yep. that's and he he doesn't do what he does for people to sit around and listen to his shit all day long. He needs me like go do something. Yeah, like, anything. He, he says on his podcast, he's always action. like he's always like I want you to stop listening to me. He's like I want you to go out. Stop listening to my podcast, do shit. So yeah, I mean, your grind was real. You spoke it into existence. Now you made that goal of being at Easy Sports within a year. Do you still set like hard goals? Because for myself, something I like I know I should do, but the way I'm, I'm building my brand, I guess, things change so quickly. So it, it for me, it doesn't feel like it's a, not a good idea, but it doesn't feel practical for me to set a goal when I have no idea what the growth is going to be or like, what platforms are going to change really quickly. I just, I just find that on a month to month basis, things change so quickly. So do you still set like tangible physical goals for yourself? Oh yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to have, it's hard to have actual success if you don't have tangible goals. Um, and that doesn't mean that it's not, I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, it, but you have to look at it and go, it's okay if I don't meet those goals. That's the, that's the thing, right? Like, yes, everything's changing, but three, six, nine month year goals, five year goals, 10 year goals. I look back and I go, what my goal was 10 years ago is not the same as what it is for 10 years from now. And it's okay that at 19, I thought at 29, this is what I was gonna be doing. And it doesn't mean I'm a failure. Right. It means my goals change. Um, and I think that there are certain things in your life that you should look at and you should go, I want this specifically. And it's a lot easier to reach a specific goal if you wrote it down, if you look at it every day, and I'm a big proponent of vision board. I just think from a from any from any perspective, if you want to go on a vacation, if you want to pay off your student loans, if you anything, right? You put it up and you look at it every day, and it is on your mind, and it is focused in on what what do you, what steps am I taking to do that? Whatever that is, doesn't matter. Uh, go to Aruba, whatever it is. Literally, what steps am I taking to crush that goal? Uh, I think it's super important, and it's always been very helpful for me. The the thing that I always say is the the clause there is that you have to be able to understand that you are not a failure if you if your goals change, right? It's okay. It's okay for your goals to change. It's okay to meet one goal and not meet another goal. It's also okay to get two months into it and go, hey, I think I learned that. I don't actually want to do that. I want to do this instead. That's yeah. Fine. You just it, it's all fluid. It should change. That's why I have a vision board on a court board because <laughs> I can take things off and put things on every day if I wanted to. Yeah. So that, that's I'm a I'm a vision board person and I think it's super helpful. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I actually just bought a whiteboard for my room that I write. It's it's big. It's like four feet by four feet. And I write, I guess I write yeah. uh, not necessarily my goals, but I write to do like I have to do lists literally just scattered all over my, um, over my room. And I guess they're, yeah, they're kind of, I guess the same thing as goals, but they're more on a, on a daily basis. So that definitely helps me when you can see it and you can visualize it, you know, exactly where you need to go. Cause you could work as hard as you want or as smart as you want. But if you're not going in the right path, like you work really hard going that way. But if your goal is actually over there and you didn't realize it, then you just went really far and worked really hard the wrong way, you know? Yeah, um, for sure. So that was, yeah, that was, that was really good stuff. You just kind of hit us with their page. And uh, I think the picture is breaking up a little bit. So I don't want you to turn into one giant pixel on the screen. So we'll kind of, <laughs> we'll, we'll cut it off here. Um, but I want to say thank you so much for coming on. This was an awesome episode as all the guests have been. Uh, let the audience know where they can find you, plug yourself away. It's plug season. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's, 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 it's plug season. So you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, the underscore sports page. 
So P A I G E with an I on Twitter and Instagram. You can subscribe to my podcast on literally any platform that exists for podcasts. So just look T E like touchdown T E fantasy. Uh, you will find it. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention it's not fantasy, but it's officially draft season, and I host all of the video content for the Draft Network. They are the best analysts in the game. They are. They grind all day long. They grind the tape. That's all they do. They have 500 scouting profiles heading into this draft season. We are going to be at the Combine. We were at Senior Bowl. We were at Shrine Bowl. And we're going to be at the NFL Draft. And we're hosting live shows that are going to be broadcasted straight to Twitter. So you can watch everything directly on Twitter. Ty Caliber producing, uh, working with an unbelievable company. And you're going to get... You're going to get mock drafts live. You're going to get <laughs> analysis live. And, and the guys, I don't write anything for the site, but the guys that do, they're incredible, and they do the work, and they totally deserve the, the love that I'm giving them because there's not enough love to give them. Yeah, I I will link all of the stuff that Paige just mentioned right down below. Will be the first thing in the de, in the description. So podcast, social medias, make sure you go and follow her. There was so much other stuff we could have got into, but I wanted to keep it around fantasy football. I wanted to hear about uh, senior we uh, the senior bowl and and the draft network. I didn't even get into because they're more football related, but a lot of cool stuff you have going on. Um, and again, thank you so much for coming on. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. If you did, make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below. Subscribe to the channel if you are new any comments concerns feedback drop them in the comment section and uh we'll see you next monday on uh on the next episode later guys